you know, I thought I had a pretty good handle on what the room was and what the story was. And then uh, I watched the movie but for the first time the other day, uh, The Disaster Artist, and it brought up a whole bunch of uh, questions that I want to ask you. So a couple of things that The Disaster Artist uh, kind of raise questions. A couple of things. Tommy often told you in the movie, don't talk about him to people, don't talk to him. And also, the other thing is that Tommy uh, had seemingly limitless financial resources, which was a big mystery in the movie. Um, what is what is the where? Do we know where Tommy got all the money to make this movie? Um, do you know? I think he was a really successful retail guy and did real estate, um, and that is all I really know. <laughs> I think, you know, meeting him... I think Tommy recently said that you're his best friend, right? Are you still... Yeah, we, well, we made a new movie called Best Friends. So okay. I think that's, best Friends, but also the R's left out of it, so it's yeah, Best Yeah, so beans. you can decide what yeah. it is. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't know before that, and I think it's kind of cool to keep the mystery. I think if you know too much, then it kind of loses its, its charm. Well, for the past... God, you know, 15 years or more now that it's been, I think a lot of people have been trying to crack the case. You know, what is this, what is this enigma of Tommy Wiseau all about? Uh, can you confirm or deny a few theories for me? Sure. Tommy Wiseau is actually a 4,000 year old vampire. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, That's not a no. <laughs> Uh, Tommy uh, Wieso was like a hitman for the Polish mob. I doubt it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Still. <laughs> Still not, not a no. no. I, would, I would deny that. Yeah. All right. Um, was it true that he thought, hey, you know, maybe I'll make my character Johnny a vampire? It was like a floating idea. I know for the most part he wanted his character Johnny to be, um, you know, a leading man like Marlon Brando. That right. was the first goal. And then if he could become a vampire after that. But that was just a maybe. That was a maybe, yeah. Okay. It, was on, it was on the table. Um, now, I thought the movie also played around with maybe some subtext or a suggestion that uh, Tommy might have been interested in you as more than just friends. Is Did you get that feeling from the movie or was that in your book? You know, the way that he really lost it when you and your girlfriend decided that you were going to move in together is what I'm thinking of specifically. I think it's more of an L.A. thing where, like, you go to L.A. to try to become an actor and you have, like, this life raft and you have a, hopefully a few friends that are doing the same thing. And I think when people start to leave, you start to lose hope. And I think it was more the thought of losing the support, I think, more so than anything else. Was I, was I picking up the wrong signals there from the movie? Or I do mean, you think the movie tried to hint at that a little bit and just dangle it out there when they made the film? I mean, I think the whole story is very bizarre. So there's probably subtext. There's probably reflections of that. But, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not But sure. you lived it. so you And you wrote the book. So did you ever get that feeling? That no, I mean, the whole thing was just bizarre. So <laughs> you, I think that it revolved around that. Uh, has this, you know, your experience with Tommy and the room and then the disaster artist, has that been a, a net positive for you as an actor and a, a film career? Or has it, would you say it's been a net wash or a negative or a positive? Or? I, it's definitely a positive. I yeah. mean, it's, it's a weird positive because in any other business, you know, you need to excel at something and do well. But with this, it became something so different that it gave you... Um, instead of just being on a TV show or whatever, like, you know, traditional mm -hmm. actor, it gave you a story and, and a unique perspective that I think you couldn't have gotten if you would have just done TV shows or films the, the normal way. So it's, um, you know, it's become a worldwide phenomenon now. And the book, you know, obviously became an award winning movie. So it's, it's been an interesting path to get there, but it's definitely been a positive. Uh, tell me about the new movie, What You Can Tell Me, Best Friends. So, or Best Fiends, if you leave the R out, so, I guess. Yeah, Best Friends comes out uh, worldwide on digital September 25th. Um, Lionsgate's going to do it. So it'll be everywhere for the first time you'll be able to see a Tommy and Greg movie <laughs> on a digital platform worldwide. So um, and, and then there's also a volume two, which comes out in January. Volume two of The Room? or of volume, Best Friends. Of Best, Best Friends. Friends, okay. So All we, right, made, this, right, we right. made this one movie, and then we realized we 
made two movies, which happens sometimes. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, so it became two films. Okay. Um, and now you say that's going to be released in a, in a digital format? So yeah. How, how would you September. see that? In September on, on demand and, um, and on digital platforms. Okay, so uh, when you were filming The Room, um, at what point did you think, you know, when did it occur to you, gee, this movie may not be an Academy Award winner? Or, you know, this movie, you know, might be made fun of or whatever second thought you might have had about doing the movie. I, you know, I never really looked at it in that way. I just picture, I just saw it as a movie Tommy wanted to make. Yeah. I was going to help him make it and that was going to be it. I didn't really expect anybody to see it. I didn't expect it. Okay, to, so you didn't expect it to be. No, I didn't expect anything really. I mean, I knew it was like Tommy's planet, what I call it, where we were going to make something that wasn't really good or bad it was just tommy but you know? weren't at any point staking your uh career on it or saying this is oh this is really gonna no, be I, my big break into showbiz no but, <laughs> <laughs> but tommy believed that right yes yeah, yeah tommy believed this was gonna be yeah he critically believed acclaimed. that if i didn't make this movie that it would be the biggest mistake i'd ever make yeah um at what point after the movie was finished did you realize hey, this thing is turning into a different thing. You know, it's going from being this project I did with my friend to a thing that people are seeking out and people are telling their friends, you got to watch it. And I got to say, you know, it's very easy to sit here and say, it's just like, oh, this is a bad movie. You should watch it because it's bad. It's more than that. It's just fascinating. The whole thing is fascinating. So... Was there any one moment where uh, we're talking to Greg Sestero, who wrote The Disaster Artist, where you said, okay, this is not what I bargained for, but it's turning into this thing that's bigger than, than what I expected? Um, I was just curious what people were going to think when they saw it. Uh -huh. And so, you know, not worried. Were you worried at all about not what people all. were going to think? No, because mm -hmm. it's, again, it's one of those things that if you're a known actor, you have something to lose. You know, in this case, I had done. Uh, all I had done is Retro Puppet Master, which was like a really bad horror sequel. Mm -hmm. So I had nothing really to lose. I was just curious what an audience would think of this because it's a movie that, you know, so many people say should have never gotten made. Um, and that's kind of fun to see an audience experience this movie and think, what am I watching? Well, <laughs> let me, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to throw in at that point, you know, it's there are plenty of people who've made movies that turn out to be bad movies because they didn't have any budget but what's so unique about this is that the room it looks like it had a budget of millions of dollars you know this wasn't like uh manos the hands of fate or something <laughs> which you know was obviously this had you know professionals working on it and and a budget which might have made it so unique yeah, and I think that's what makes it work when you you see the green screen and the backdrop and all that stuff. There's a lot of elements that, you know, make it the room. But, um, no, when people start showing up and throwing spoons and yelling at the screen, I mean, it's one of those things you can't plan for. Right. You know, you can try to make a cult movie and it doesn't work. And there's only been a couple in the last, you know, 20, 30 years that have done this. So um, I became intrigued when people started showing up. And, 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 and so when you say they would show up, they would show up at theaters uh, they, there that was they would they would uh, rent themselves or that Tommy would. Uh, how would it work that you would go see this movie? It would play once a month in L.A. at the Sunset Five mm -hmm. and, and like a thousand people would show up every month. Yeah. And they'd bring spoons. It was like I turned into a Rocky <laughs> Horror. Exactly. Type of thing. Yeah. So uh, that was really intriguing to me because I love movies. And I thought, what does this movie have <laughs> that all these other movies don't? I mean, you know, seven, ten 15 years later, people are still showing up to see this movie, and there's new releases that people don't even care about. So it, it superseded anything I could have ever expected. And then for me, I just became intrigued what, what was in it that people wanted to see. Okay.